Hello, Dick. Welcome. Thank you, Miriam. I'm so delighted that you're here. I'm I'm very happy that you uh, were willing to um, to help us with this and let us know how you uh, create work examples with your subject matter experts. Um, would you mind introducing yourself first to our audience? Well, just a bit of a background. In this area, for the last 25 to 30 years, I've worked with a variety of corporations and government offices, both in the United States, Canada, and Europe, actually. Uh, one of my examples in Europe was I worked for some time with the European Patent Office when they were getting started in Munich to design the training that they use. Um, I'm a psychologist. Um, I also had a professorship at a, at a number of universities over a period of years where I taught training design and um, instruction. Um, I, that's it. I, I developed a, and have a, had a research center for a number of years where I primarily did research on what we're talking about, which is basically the creation of worked examples. Brilliant. So what, what is your definition of a worked example? Well, basically, a work example is whatever you would need to teach somebody to do something, more or less. I mean, it is a how-to that includes all of the steps that you have to perform, and at each step, what you have to notice, what you have to be able to know about, both what to do and why you're doing it, let's say. Is that enough? I mean, it, I could go on and on with the definition, but it's used in training, I think, as a standby for... What do you need to train somebody to do something? The more accurate the work example, the more complete it is, the more that it's meaningful to trainees, the more effective it is, basically. That makes a lot of sense. So when you uh, work with, I don't know, experts, subject matter expert, whatever you call them, like how do you work with them to create work examples? Well, very briefly, the first thing we, we do is want to make sure that we actually have an expert to work with. This is not just a person that does the job. This is a person that succeeds and that you have evidence they succeed if possible. And we also like to have people that have done the job recently because sometimes people are available that did the job years ago, but jobs change, things change, policies change, and so on. So recent, they have to be a bit cooperative. Some experts just don't want to be bothered and they're impatient and so on because we're not only asking them a lot of questions, we tell them we're gonna to have to interrupt them quite often to ask them detail. We explain to them that we're serving in the stead of the trainees that are gonna be trained to do their job the way that they do it. And it's their excellence that we want to transmit to those trainees. In order to do that, we're gonna to have to ask detailed questions that might be boring occasionally, but ask them to please suffer along with us. Yeah, that makes sense. So how do you then start? Well, we basically start by asking him to tell us all the tasks that need to be performed. These are kind of the large chunks of whatever it is that we're, we're uh, capturing. We don't care what task they describe to us. It's important to know that we always interview at least three experts. There's huge evidence that that's kind of a magic number in terms of capturing as much as we can, because each expert will remember about a third of certain things. And there's not, a lot, for, for some reason, there's not a lot of overlap. So three experts, we always interview them separately. It's critical to do this. We know there are people that disagree with this and interview them together. We've tried it, studied it both ways and found out when we interview them together, they argue with each other and they negotiate an approach that doesn't necessarily represent the kind of worked example that's gonna work with trainees. So, so you are saying that they compromise then and then you don't get like what they actually yep, do. They get, they get fed up with an argument and they say, okay, all right, okay, we'll, we'll do it that way. But when they're alone, They'll tell you exactly how they think they do it. And then we capture each person. We record what they say, sometimes video and audio. If they're going to be using their hands, we do video. And then we transcribe the, the audio portion into the steps that they've given us. Then we look at all three of those transcriptions and we go back to them a second time trying to resolve some of the differences between them. That seems to work. I'll say that that's the expert part. When they give us the tasks, we don't care what tasks they mention. We just start with the first one they gave us and we ask them, tell, describe how to do that step by step. Yeah. 
And as we listen to the steps, we're listening for two things. One is what we call action steps, things they do with their hands and so on, and decision steps, which is they get to a point where they have to decide, am I going to go this way or that way? Here's the reason that we make this distinction that we have learned, and the evidence is now overwhelming, that experts can only remember approximately 30% of the decisions they make when they do a job. In other words, 70% of what they so fluidly and easily do is not available to them consciously. Mm. And so, so automated. Yeah, and yeah. but different experts will remember different decisions, which is another reason to interview three of them and so on. Um, and so we're also listening for types of knowledge they're describing to us. And we basically, we have a, a system we call CP3. In other mm. words, C is concepts. Yeah. And then uh, a concept is a term. And when we hear a term, we think the novices won't understand. We ask them to define it. Secondly, a process, how something works. Oh, that's a, that's a so-and-so. Can you describe how that works from start, sort of from start to finish quickly? And then a principle. That's the third P. Principles are cause and effect things. And in many fields that are science-based, there are a variety of principles that are, that are, are there and available. There's one other thing. There's certain facts. These are just statements that somebody has to remember, like the temperature at which something happens or whatever it is. So we capture those also. So we're capturing the steps. And then within the steps, we're capturing the concepts somebody has to understand to do that step, the process that it's a part of, any principles involved, and any facts that students are going to have to know. The other thing that we're looking for when we do this is um, actually the procedural steps also. Yeah. And we, if we don't understand something that the, that the expert says about a given step, we ask them, obviously. So um, let's, let's just repeat that for us. So it's, it's concepts, processes, principles, and procedures. Yes. Yes. Okay. And, you know, not a lot of analysts work for types of knowledge, but we find that they're really critical. And doing it this way has a huge impact on learning. Uh, we separate students into two groups, and one of the groups is taught by the experts that we've interviewed. The other group is taught by trainers that have no expertise, but that use the worked examples that we collect. And the people in the, uh, in the worked example group actually have scores that are about 90% above the average of the other group. So even the group that the experts teach, and by the way, most experts are teachers. They're, most of them are trainers. They, they're the ideal choice for it. But they're so automated at what they do that the knowledge they have becomes unconscious. They can do it, but they don't have to think about it. And as a psychologist, I can say the reason for that is that your mind actually has very little space to think consciously about things. You have to reserve it for novel events. And your mind then automates the things that you repeat over and over again. You can observe yourself doing things with your hands, but you can't observe what you do with your mind. So when it automates something, you don't gone, know. Gone, gone for you, yeah. Gone, yeah. So this is the reason to be really open and kind of keep experts talking about and being curious about did you have to make a decision to get there at this point? So we keep, we actually stop them every now and then and say, why did you make that change? Was there a decision you made? And they'll, and they'll say, oh yeah, yeah. You have to go back and there's these three different choices and it's often choice number two, but sometimes it's one or three. And then you get, you ask them what it is, you build that into the training. So you're so, saying that because you interviewed three of them, all of them have gaps, but because you have three different people you, you are able to, you can be confident that you now have captured. More, yeah, more of the decisions. Prim it's primarily decisions. Mm. Uh, and those are the things that cause so much trouble in organizations. When, when trainees don't learn to make decisions, number one, or to make them accurately, number two, it can cause huge troubles in organizations. I could go on for an hour on examples of when those things have happened, in my experience, in very capable organizations. Can you give one example? I think that's interesting to... Yeah, okay. We work 
We work a lot in medical schools with, with physicians and primarily with surgeons because they do things with their minds and with their hands all the time. So they're good examples. And when they make mistakes, it's a matter of public record. So we know who's capable and who isn't. So we know we've good experts. So when we work with an, one thing that there's, there's a couple things that have happened in the past that have been real problems. For example, we were, we were capturing how to, uh, how to fix a problem that with people who have money, they have minor problems. But so the students were learning how to fix this particular problem with very well off patients who come to the medical school for treatment. But they were going out into um, uh, hospitals where poorer people were being served. And in those places, their problems were much larger. They didn't learn how to handle the large problems, only the small ones. And they were having huge numbers of problems in this other program. Um, there are emergency procedures that we taught that the experts always told us what the most common thing was, like where to inject fluids into a person's body, but not the uncommon ones. If that place was injured, they had to do it somewhere else. They never told us about those things. So again, trainees were learning how to do it in a common way, but they would be failing in less typical situations. That's so important, right? In 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 the in the context of complex tasks, that people yes. get like that variety of examples, so that they start to see. Yep. Um, we then take the three versions that we get of how to do this. These this these three versions of the worked examples with all the embedded concepts and process knowledge and principles, and the explanation of why we do things. Yeah. And we take the three and we gradually put them together into one, we call it one gold standard worked example. That has all of the decisions, all the actions, all of the concepts, processes, and principles that trainees need to know. We take that gold standard draft and we show it to all three of the experts and say, what's wrong with this? What did we forget? Sometimes we also take it to a fourth expert who hasn't been involved. Hasn't been involved, yeah. And we ask them to review it and see if it's accurate or not. And then, so we, then you have the gold standard, which mm -hmm. is the output from you know all the work that you've done with your subject matter experts. So how does this gold standard now become a worked example for the learner? Well, you have everything that you need for the learner. You just simply have to take the worked example and put it in some kind of a development medium. You either present. Would you would you produce the the golden the golden standard with all the possibilities? N no, we take a best approach in the gold standard, and okay. one that would be meaningful to the trainees that are going to be learning how to do that set of tasks. And we make certain that if, by the way, you also have to check an organization and find out if what's being done is within the policy limits of the organization. We find experts. Often, oh, they find workarounds, corners, yeah. and do things that they shouldn't be doing. And actually, in some cases, organizations need to take a different look at their policy. We find, but basically, we have to make sure that we're not teaching something that violates a policy within an organization. Um, I think in every case, we have had to change some things to make things compatible with policy. But this document, this gold standard, then only needs to be translated into whatever mediums available to teach people, whether it's live and trainers or a computer, overhead transparency, whatever they are. Yeah, I was just going to say, could you give some examples of what a worked example in reality looks like? Um, I mean, it wouldn't be a Word document usually, right? Yeah, almost always. I, I actually I will and sort of probably should have some that I can show you. We also, by the way, create something we call job aids. Oh, yeah. And a job aid embeds that worked example into a here's exactly how you do this. In other words, it takes only the high points and it's something that people can keep in their desk or in their pocket. A best job aid to me is something on a card that you can put in your pocket. Yeah. So that when somebody's on the job, they can pull it out and remind themselves of what the key steps are or what what the conditions are for starting this particular start part of the procedure. Those can, that's a decision. Is that condition there? Should I actually begin this next part or should I wait? All those things that are critical then are on that job that they carry away from them with the, from the uh, training. 
So were you just saying I didn't? Uh, is it is it usually a document or no? It's always a document to start with. To start with, yeah. The training itself, however, could be and could take the information from that document and put it in almost any form. Yeah. Including you could basically have an actor who's describing how to do it and demonstrating certain things on video. Yeah. Yeah, that makes total sense. And and to me, it sounds like when you have that worked example, so you have your, your documents and you create an initial worked example for the learner, but because you have everything, you have everything you need for the rest of your training. Right. So your correct. training is design is more or less finished at that point. And, and you know, by doing it this way, I, I think a lot of organizations resist investing this kind of effort in training. They don't really check to see if their training works or who knows what when they go out on the job or what consequence it has for performance in the organization. When you do that, however, you find huge benefits that, that there's such a cost benefit in, in this process that spending a little bit more time at the front end to create accurate worked examples and complete worked examples hugely pay off later financially for organizations. The evidence is there, it's been published. I mean, people learn more, up to 90% more actually on the on average than, the, than, than groups taught a different way. Uh, they learn almost twice as quickly, so you so your trainees are spending less time in training. That's least that's less expensive. More importantly, when they get out on the job, they're making better decisions. And I don't think organizations realize how much of how many of their problems are caused by people making poor decisions. I think we can conclude that everybody should start. All organizations should start to think about in which context work examples are actually uh, the way to go. And I think they would uh, realize that that's more than they would have imagined. And do that by actually checking in a systematic way for evidence for its impact. Because people are not inclined to believe that it works here. Oh, it worked over in that other place you're talking about, but it wouldn't work here, I don't think. Check and find out if you're a rational organization, if you're concerned about your bottom line and your investors, check. It doesn't cost that much to do some studies to actually count and find out what the both financial and time benefit is for these things. That's, I think, what's most important. Rather than just making a quick judgment based on a lack of experience with all this, consider it. It's actually gotten a lot of people in, in interested um, and, and the data that's being developed out of these worked examples that are done with this cognitive task analysis. We're getting a lot of investment in trying to produce automated systems that would do this for, for businesses. I think that's the future to some extent, but that's a number of years in the future. It's not going to happen right away. It's a very complex thing. Well, we'll get back to you then. And uh, for now, thank you very much for all the great explanations. And I hope that everybody will start doing this. Thank you, Miriam. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.